And also about 8 o'clock, Elvis Costello has promised to drop by to play tracks from his new album, Goodbye Cruel World. That's around 8, and to get us in the mood, here's the theme from Scully. <laughs> Seven, Elvis Costello and the Attractions. The B-side of the single, that one's Turning the Town Red from the Scully TV show. Elvis Costello and the Attractions album, Goodbye at Cruel World. Elvis will be talking us through that LP in just a moment. After we listen to this track off the album, also the current single, I Wanna Be Loved. Beloved, the current single from Elvis Costello. Welcome along, Mr. C. Hello. All right, you've got the new album out then, at the moment, just coming out into the shops. Goodbye, Cruel World. That's right. The title, quite a striking cover too. Um, a remarkable picture of some sort of hilltop with a couple of trees and, a, and a, a guy fencing in the middle of it. What's it all about, actually? That's Steve. Yeah. And he just happened to be fencing on the top of a hill. Well, that's one day. When, when, like he always is. <laughs> yeah. Where was the picture taken? Um. Uh, Venus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't give away too much. It's, it's a very striking cover. And in fact, we were just discussing the photographs and the, and the pictures on the, the sleeve. Quite a lot of artistic content going into this. Is it your design? Uh, no, it's Phil Smee who, who, who did, well, the, the layout is and the photographs by Brian Griffin. Mm -hmm. These are make very nice postcards, actually, like the picture of you on the back there with the... Uh, Paving stones. Oh, yeah, the picture of me looks like this man is currently serving 20 years in an Angolan <laughs> jail for being a mercenary. You're not looking very happy, are you? Uh, <laughs> goodbye, Cruel World. Why, why the name? Goodbye, Cruel World. What was the thought? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it uh, seemed like a, a good idea at the time, as they say. Um, <laughs> it, you can draw any significance you want from it. I, I'm quite happy for people to misunderstand it or understand it. All right. Okay. That's a fair enough answer, I suppose. You've been doing so many different sorts of music of late and um, different projects. Was it difficult for you to um, decide what sort of style you were going to make this LP? I, I don't think it is in any style. I mean, this this album isn't really in one style. Uh, the single, you know, is not at all representative any more than Peace in Our Time, which came out as an imposter record before, which is just sort of my way of keeping it... So people are really... Ironically enough... So, by not calling it under my name, it makes it more personal, you know, because people some mm. maybe perhaps expect... I don't know what they expect anymore from Elvis Costello and the attractions, you know, because we, we have done quite a lot of things in the last few years. And um, I don't think any one track you could say, well, that's definitely what it sounds like, this album. We've got it, we've got it pinned down now. Uh, hopefully there's enough variation in there. I just want each song to be as strong as I could make it. Obviously not every song is the best song you've ever written. That would be absolutely impossible. Uh, I think among some of the songs on this album are among the best I've written. And I think overall it's the best album that we've made because it, it's, there's more stories and interest in it. And uh, hopefully the playing, you know, uh, I think complements the uh, sort of ideas we're trying to get across. Do you think there is, an, is there any problem, though, if you do have so much variety then on the album or so many different directions that people might get a bit confused as to what you are at, you know? But well, I don't see why people have to be worried about where you're at at this moment. Why then just enjoy it as it comes up? They either will like the songs individually or they won't like them. I mean, they're not going to like every track necessarily. I don't think it's that varied. It's not, like, wildly varied. It's not, like, willfully difficult to listen to. I mean, I'm not trying to confuse you know confuse anybody just just for the sake of it. Mm. It's just where wherever the direct wherever the song took me in the writing of it. Um, hopefully, we try to reflect that in the recording of it. I suppose it's fair enough because you look back to some of the classic albums, say by the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, or something like that, and there's so much variety on that, and nobody complained then. No, it's just got <laughs> this thing of everything sounding the same as a. So I think the Americans invented it, you know. Mm. And it's been taken up by all the electro pop bands here as well. They seem to just pull out yeah. one after another. Let's play a track from the album. This is called Room with No Number.
no number, Elvis Costello and the attractions from the new album Goodbye Cruel World. We were just talking while it was on, Elvis and I, about the, the sort of drum sound on that, which is incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's good, yeah. yeah. It's recorded at Sound West, this uh, album, which is the same studio as, you know, that Trevor Horn Trevor and all that, studio, yeah. yeah. And obviously, uh, a lot of care has gone into the sort of sound and everything there. And uh, Alan Winstanley is really, you know, he, he was like really playing with it, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> they have, they Alan, have, come back. <laughs> 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 they have got a distinctive uh, drum sound, actually, haven't they, Clive? Yeah, it, they? you know, sometimes it's quite metallic almost, you know. So it's like, it's, it's quite, it is a sort of modern drum sound, but the, everybody's, all producers have got some sort of di di distinctive sound. I don't think it's too overpowering. It can sound quite powerful when it needs to, but it isn't one of those drum sounds that it's instantly recognisable and therefore you really know exactly like Phil Collins or something where you Don't there is a very, very little point in hearing it beyond the first few bars because you know how how deep and loud it's going to get whereas this I mean they just use like heavier sounds when necessary and lighter ones when necessary I think they're much more in tune with the arrangement Clive and Alan I take it Sam West is absolutely packed with the sort of latest technology of well, the recording it's, age you know, you it's, know? One, it's one of the better equipped studios in London definitely uh, you know there, there are quite a few um, I, I don't, you know, personally speaking, I don't think it's necessary to have all the gadgets. But obviously, if you are going to record uh, with the sophisticated technology, it's best to have the best rather than to have somewhere in between. To go, if you're going to go the other way, then, you know, I, I could just as happily go and record in Pathway Studios where I did my first album, which is an eight track and yeah. has very little in the way of, of you know, complicated electronic effects. Because I can imagine that you can really get bogged down in the technology and can, uh, it actually can get in the way of what you're trying to do sometimes. Well, yeah, I, 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 that's, where, that's where it helps to have like a two-man team because one's always tapping the other on the shoulder if that ever mm. happens. And then with me interfering as well, it <laughs> uh, means that we get the job done eventually, you know. And when, it is true when I've produced people myself in more sophisticated studios, you have to be careful not to get too carried away. Don't you get carried away a bit uh, in wanting to produce yourself? I mean, do you like just standing back and letting the others do it? Well, I do interfere quite a lot, maybe, maybe sometimes unnecessarily so, you know. I mean, for instance, on that track, um, because it t it came a long way from the original song. The original song was in fact a country song, and uh, after rehearsals, uh, we went on the road a short tour of France, and and uh, two of the songs on the album I rewrote, and that was one of them, uh, because I want it was such a morbid story because it's about a lover's suicide, uh, not necessarily actual. Mm -hmm. It could be allegorical. Um, I thought it should have a, a more a jaunty sort of tune that would suggest sort of dream element whether it could be regarded as fantasy and uh, Steve got into the arrangement of the keyboards on it which sort of gave it this sort of sort of queasy sort of effect and um, there were quite a lot of these parts on there which you can hear I mean if you listen to it a few times there's quite a f lot of things going on, on the keyboards but uh, for instance I, I, I asked for the drums to be turned up on this track because I really like the drum pattern mm. and I've I figured it was the danger of it becoming too sweet because if you do put on too many lines, you, there is a thing, and, and therefore I'm glad that we did that. Just little suggestions like that, which because they get so concentrated on these really good sounds, sometimes you can lose the perspective of the track. But the number of times I had to, I felt, you know, that I was justified in doing that were like one or two times in the whole making of the album. The rest of the time, I, I'm absolutely, ha you know, I'm happy to let let them do it because otherwise what's the point of getting a producer if you're going to interfere only sometimes they ask my opinion so you know it's just an echo on a voice something that's a bit more personal to your own performance you know for god's sake hide my guitar playing <laughs> <Things like that. laughs> here's another track it's called the only flame in town called The Only Flame in Town from Elvis Costello's new album, Goodbye Cruel World, and Elvis is talking to us tonight. Well, we were just saying there that uh, Daryl Hall appears on that one. Yeah, that's Daryl singing backup vocals there. He's the, he's the tall blonde one on that track. <laughs> Hall and Costello. Yeah, How it doesn't this, roll off the tongue quite. It doesn't sound the same, does it? How did this come together? You've been uh, meaning to work together, have you? Well, no, really, I, I must admit to not being sort of like a, a, a major fan of theirs. I like the singles, and I just really think he's got a good voice, and I needed a high, somebody that could sing high and... You know, because when I track my voice up, I can get up to the harmony on that uh, that track, uh, but it would sound quite harsh, and I didn't want it to get harsh because this song was written as a ballad originally, and but and we we still do it at the moment. Um, 
as a, as a ballad, but it was hard to get the right sort of tension into the recording of it. It was like a straightforward, real, like, classic R&B ballad. And um, so Clive sort of persuaded me to get a slightly more interesting rhythm going, but I would still sing it like a ballad, mm. quite softly, so I didn't want to sort of ha suddenly have this harsh harmony on there, and also I get a bit tired of hearing my own voice harmonising with myself. You so, quite often criticise your own vocals, don't you? You're not... Uh, sorry? You're, you're a very harsh critic of your own singing. Well, I... I well, it's just says sort of what what sounds good for you know it wasn't appropriate for this for the track. Yes, yeah, somebody else in that, right, yeah. yeah. And there are not that many people in England that can sing up high like that and pure. And he was around, and I asked him if he'd do it, and he was great. You know, he just came in, no pretensions about it. Did it in an hour, which is really <laughs> really hard work because he was phrasing to an existing vocal, and you've got to learn somebody's phrasing because it's a cl you know it's a close harmony as opposed to a stacked backing vocal. Mm -hmm. And he and he was really good, you know, and. Uh, you know, the only, the only drag about it is now people will be really convinced I'm a midget, you know, because he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to appear in our video, hopefully. And, uh, oh, great. And then, you know, I've spent all this time trying to convince people that I'm not five foot nothing, and, and then I have to appear with Daryl Hall. He's about like, nine foot tall. Yeah. yeah. You're going to work with him again, then, in the future, I do you think? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, if, he wants me, if, he if he wants me to return the favour and... Uh, you know, play some lead guitar on his uh, album, you know, I'd be, I'd be really glad to do it, you know. I hope, I hope he's listening tonight, eh? Bagpipes or something. Yeah. <laughs> you were talking again about going back and changing the, the nature of a song. Do you find you do that quite a lot, that you, you put a song down and then go back and fiddle with it again after uh, Yeah, there's like, on oh, this album, I, um, I had two songs already written, which were solid, and, and one I wrote with Clive Langer the great unknown and I had two songs which I, I'd written around the time of Punch the Clock but they didn't really fit in so I kept them on ice cause, and I sort of modified them ever so slightly more in arrangement than anything else and the rest of the songs I, I locked myself in an office in Acton and in uh, January or late January early February and wrote I had all my ideas stored up and instead of writing them over a long period of time I wouldn't let myself write anything so I waited and waited and then locked myself in this office and for about two weeks and in the end I wrote like eight songs in, in six days and, uh, like I said before, a couple of them I modified after that. We went into rehearsals and some of them didn't work. And I changed bits. And, of course, a lot of arrangements got changed radically from the initial song. But a burst of songwriting like that sometimes can get a sort of tension into it that mm. perhaps was lacking in some of the lesser songs on the last album. You know, I, I personally think this album's more connected by the way of writing rather than it being any kind of identifiable style to it, you know. Mm. I find it really weird that you say you can just sit and lock yourself in a room and suddenly songs pour out of your pen. I well, th that's what I say, from storing up them up, uh, it, it made it more frustrating because I wouldn't let myself write them. I had all these ideas going around in my head and it was like, it got to the point where it was a relief to get some of them out because they were uh, starting to buzz around in the, in, in, inside and... You, know, you, you can actually feel them in there, can you? Well, Even though yeah, they sort of, you, know, you get bits of melody. I said, no, I won't finish this. I won't rush it. You know, I'll, I'll really sort of try and hone it. Rather than writing it and then changing it, I was honing it in my head and then wrote it quickly to try and get slightly more structure to it. And I think the better songs anyway definitely benefited from that. Some of them are just almost like, not throwaway, but they're not supposed to, their tongue is a bit in the cheek, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, this is one that you said you wouldn't uh, actually tell us what it's all about, so we'll listen to it anyway. This well, you is don't need to, it's all there in the lyrics. <laughs> Home Truth. <laughs> Home Truth, Elvis Costello and the Attractions. Talking to Elvis now, and you've, uh, you've chosen a record now, actually, that isn't off your album. Uh, a band called Los Lobos. Yeah. You, you talked briefly about them on Round Table a couple of weeks ago, but what's the appeal of this lot? I just think it's a great record. It's just so full of life. It's sort of kind of doesn't, you know, it's not got no big axe to grind or anything. Oh, that's, you know, uh, sometimes I think everything can be taken a bit too seriously. So I say some of the songs on our album are, they're about stuff, but they're not like deadly serious. This is really important, yeah. you know. No, you know, more, more so than the, I think people are aware of, really. What, you think people sometimes overanalyze what you do? Oh, definitely, yeah. And and, and this band is just because it's just, it's just a, it's thrilling, you know, that's what I think about it. It's just thrilling, you know, just... Tell us about them. Where do they come from? Things all, like I, all I know about them is uh, I think they're from East Los Angeles or something. That's, I, I don't know anything about them, really. I just... T-Bone Burnett, who supported me on my solo tour of America, he produced this album and he said, you've got to get hold of this. And he gave me a copy of, of the cassette and I put it on and I just went, well, ah, you know, this is it. Marvellous, you know. And this mm -hmm. is only a mini album. I think they're doing their album at the moment. Uh, so, you know... The best is yet to come, I hope, you know. It's good time music, basically. Well, uh, you know, that's sort of a bit glib, but it, it, it is, <laughs> Well, yeah. I am glib sometimes, <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> it's too, you know, it's just great, <laughs> is what it is. All right, and it's called Let's Say Goodnight, a track from the album by Los Lobos. Mm -hmm. 
Los Lobos, let's say goodnight. We'll have more from our live guest, Elvis Costello, in a moment. That's after the news at 8.30. My guest, Elvis Costello, we're discussing his album. Sounds like the Kane Gang, man. That was the Kane Gang. Yeah. Well I'll, spotted. I love their new record. That's super, isn't it? The beautiful ballad. Mm. I, I, in fact, we played it on the show a couple of months ago as a sort of first play, and I think it's a, a real standout and quite different for them. I've only, uh, well, I, um, when I say I love it, I mean, uh, I love the song. I haven't actually heard the record yet. I heard, you I heard a live... You know, TV thing of it. That's good. Which is terrific. It is excellent. Your album's called Goodbye Cruel World. We're going to play a track which, uh, to me, in my glib way, sounds like it's a, a bit jazzy coming up now. The comedian. <laughs> I got it really in the neck because I said <laughs> <Yeah>. it's glib. <laughs> but uh, um, this, this, uh, you are sort of into jazz. You listen a lot to jazz anyway, don't well, you? Well, no, not that much, actually. Uh, well, you, you borrowed a record from the BBC, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a while back. It must be true. Um, I'm, I am... Um, yeah, I'd listen to some jazz, but I wouldn't say it's a major influence. This is really just the re the reason this com anybody would say this is jazzy because it's in five four instead of four four three four, mm. and it was only because this song is about sort of insincere friendship, and I wanted it to sound kind of peculiar, a little bit off centre, as it were, and that five four has that effect on you. Mm. And it was written originally as a ballad, but the sentiments of the song weren't really didn't require it to be a ballad. It wasn't that serious that or, or any you know it didn't have to be that dramatic much better that it's kind of off the cuff really and this has that kind of slightly humorous sort of sound to it i think it's pretty <laughs> pretty humorous song right. appropriate for the comedians absolutely right the comedians elvis costello and the attractions you've um it's like that like that advert for the fruit gums you know like can you <laughs> can you put one in your mouth without chewing can you play that without laughing <laughs> <laughs> it has a really strange effect on audiences. We did it in France, and they just seem to warm to it so much. Maybe it sounds French. I don't know. It does have a sort of a continental feel There's to a it. Track on the way. other side, love feel, which I think is French. I want to have it translated into French and get. Are you going to sing it? Yourself, no, no, no. I want. I, I, I want uh, Sasha Destel. Or something. Oh no, I want a woman to sing it. It should yeah. be a woman singing it in a breathy sort of French accent. Yeah. Oh, good. You, you're um, also involved in in this record label, aren't you? In Records. Yeah, but, well, I mean, I kept it going after I released the Imposter record, mm. uh, the first one. The, the actually, the Peace in Our Time record wasn't on Imp. It was an LCA release. Um, and I, uh, I, we did the Philip Chevron record, Captains and the Kings, which came out. That should have been a hit, you know. I don't know why it wasn't in the end. Well, I think that it's just a bit difficult to fit in, really, because, you know, with not having drums, things without drums on, you know, they're, unless they're Christmas records, you know, of choirs or something, or flying pickets or something, you know, it's really hard to kind of fit them in, I suppose. Um, and, you know, it sort of exists in, in sort of record business limbo, which means, you know, when, I, when I'm available to do something with it, actually, currently, there is a project in hand. Philip Chevron is actually producing an album of a woman named Agnes Burnell of some old, quite old and fascinating songs, which, again, I don't think are actually mainstream. I don't expect them to race at the top of the charts, but the album will be out hopefully in September. It's called Fathers Lying Dead on the Ironing Board, <laughs> which gives you some <laughs> idea of the, of the humour of it. Where, where uh, does she come from, then? Uh, well, she has an amazing, colourful history, and I really wouldn't like to talk out of turn. I think... Hopefully, when the record comes out, somebody can be persuaded to interview her. Yeah. Hopefully, not on the sort of late night arts programs, but on you know Radio One because uh, she's absolutely fascinating. How old is she then? Aren't you? Um, I, well, I think it's a little bit indelicate for me to say, but she's I, been around she, a few years. It's fair to well, say, isn't it? Yeah. When she, well, let's put it this way: she, I have a picture in a book of her when she was in a cabaret troupe in 1939. She was 16 then, so work it out for yourself. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, but you know, she's a marvelous, marvelous lady with a tremendous personality, and you know. Uh, fund of absolutely incredible s stories and her feeling and her connection with this material albeit you know s german songs that you know that she translated in fact the the humor of them is mostly very grim uh i think it's quite uh appealing sounds a little bit of a glib phrase but it's they're just i find them fascinating and hopefully the album will be i think it could be quite compelling listening and will this mark a sort of reactivation then for him will you have well, more it's always records there coming, yeah I'm, I'm you know i'm cons I, I mean i'm always uh, open to tapes I mean, this is sort of cue to be swamped isn't Absolutely, it you know? yeah. but uh, i i have had a few tapes but a few things that have come up I, I really did think that the bands particularly with with bands you feel like they really should have the support and the commitment of a, a, you know, a bigger record company, somebody that can actually do something for them. I'm always a, up for putting out uh, a one-off single, which is really all that I can commit to, unless, you know, there's a project that really isn't going to be made elsewhere. 
I feel, you know, I'm all for doing, because Demon in the early set, which is one of the FBeat subsidiaries, mostly licenses uh, albums from America and puts out singles, and we have Edsel, which uh, does reissues. Those great 60s reissues. Yeah, and, and the soul do, yeah. things. We've got amazing, uh, well, I say we, Andrew Lauder, who's like slaving away over a hot, you know, sort of catalogues of things, and, you know, they're, they're dealing with the delving into the vaults of the major record companies is quite a, a full-time business, you know. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't want to sort of even vaguely take any credit, but it's just so f fascinating that you can just get these things and nobody's interested. And he's trying to put them out and get we get good artwork and you know really and uh, good sleeve notes that really tell the story because a lot of this music is new to people and but it's just as good now as when it was made. Mm. And um, but and we did put out a lot of one-off singles on Demon early on, uh, and we don't do so much of that now. So it really, uh, you know. The new demon, in a way. Well, it? not yeah. It's like so things that you know t take my interest that I feel I can really be some use. Mm. I don't want to start stealing a band's best song from for the Imp label when they really should be going and getting a big advance off somebody and making a career. You know, yeah, sorry. it's really unfair that when when people cream off the best material. I don't I don't want to be like that. But if the, if a band's got something that they think it's like going to be an Imp type thing, I, there's there's no rules. There's, there is no ultimate imp record it's just got to be something that's good you know got a feeling you're going to get some interesting tapes sent to you <laughs> this week <laughs> back to the album this is a, a track called sour milk cow blues <laughs> Sour Milk Cow Blues from Elvis Costello's album Goodbye Cruel World. You've been busy watching... by little hands of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> You've been watching television a lot recently, haven't you? Oh, never no, 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 miss a you, Monday night. Do you enjoy watching yourself on As Scully? As a fact, you know, I've only seen, because I've been away when the series started, I've only seen one live I missed last week's and... So you had your video out as well, I take it. Yeah, I've been trying to catch up, you know, so... It, you know, it's just very peculiar. A lot of people are going, well, okay, when's he going to come on then? You know, because they're not very recognisable without my glasses on. So how did you come to be in this thing in the first place? Was it your idea or did they come to you? Uh, well, no, it was. It came about from be becoming acquainted through an another abortive project, with becoming acquainted with Alan Bleasdale. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he came to see us and announced, you know, we were having a drink afterwards, you know, came around my mum's house in Liverpool and... He announced that he thought I could act, you know. So, uh, so um, I said, "Oh, right, it's your play, mate." You know, so, but you know, I mean, it was really, you know, he had the confidence to sort of say, "You could do this," mm. and I never ever considered acting at all, you know. So, like, it's the, one of the pitfalls of pop stardom, as they say, you know, is the minute you get your movie on the front of uh, for a few magazines, you immediately presume that you can play Hamlet, you know. <laughs> and you know, he just said, "Well, you could do this, and I think it would be good," and um, I said, "Okay." Right, you know, I'll have a go. And everybody was, you know, I must say that, that the only thing I I, re I regret a little bit about it is that uh, I've sort of got a lot of individual publicity because it's me in it, and I feel a little bit bad about that in respect to the other people that are in it who were extremely generous to me in the making of it, and because they could have, I would have quite ex um, understood if they'd resented, you know, my sudden it's appearance upstarts, in yes. it, you know, something right. like just wal waltzing in and taking. You know what? Although I'm not in it very much, it's a nice role, you know, which somebody could have made of their own, and uh, everybody was really helpful as well because I was extremely nervous, particularly uh, Drew Schofield, the play guy. He was like really kind of when we went for takes, he'd make little suggestions and things like that because it's just like anything you don't, you know, like going in the studio for the first time. It's a completely new set of discipline, and the fact that I didn't have any dialogue to learn to, uh, to speak of. Um, you know, it d still doesn't make it any easier. It makes it a little bit easier, but you're still really nervous and everything. And, and that was, um, overall, it was a really good feeling. You know? Do you think you're going to do any more acting in the future? It's you know, it's completely in the. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I'm not going to go around sort of like all Looking going through for auditions. Strips, yeah. yeah, I'm hoping, you know, really secretly in my heart, I'm hoping for it to do a remake of Stardust or <laughs> Privilege. <you know? laughs> I think I could really lend a lot to that role. All right. It's funny, actually, because you're really quite a shy person, yet there you go. You, you, first of all, you can act on telly, and then you can also go out on tour and perform in front of a vast crowd. You don't get worried by uh, all that live performance stuff. So. Uh, I do, yeah. I get nervous. I'm unbearable on the days of big gigs to be with, you know. I can be really horrible, because uh, I just get so selfish and single-minded about it. That's all that matters, the routine of my day, and if it's interrupted, or, you know, if the... If the shirt I want to wear, the button comes off, you know, it's like, I'm not like, we don't start running, burst into tears or anything, but, you know, it really throws me off my stride. Little things can, mm. uh, you know, if something goes wrong like that, because I have a sort of terrible superstitious ritual towards it, you know. How was America as a solo tour? I mean, the pressure was really on you there. Uh, well, and like I said, I didn't even, 
I didn't even notice it until about the third gig because I was just so petrified I couldn't tell you anything about the first two or three gigs and then once I got past New York which is daunting in itself to play New York as always and we, it was a particularly daunting hall which uh, the Avery Fisher Hall which is one of the it's a bit like the festival hall or something and the, even the audience were like on their best behaviour and then you know I was starting to learn what I could do and take more liberties and I in fact found that far from it being having to constrict myself more that the freer I was with what I did the better it seemed to be and uh, therefore I changed the show a lot more from night to night and take a lot more chances and it, and it just you know I, I sort of gained my confidence we ended up like doing numbers with T-Bone Burnett and I together and things like that which were just like jabbing the audience in the chest a little bit and saying look don't take this too seriously it's not don't sit there and be all reverent and and you know li be listening and analyzing the lyrics because you know I was trying to sing some songs are obviously serious and 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 sad but you know I, uh, I did that song uh, uh, what I, li I like most about you is your girlfriend Joy Damas song just on acoustic guitar and you know that was uh, it took the audience the first verse to think he, he's singing a funny song uh, <laughs> you know because you know, it is basically a humorous song and 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 uh you know, they, they took him a little while to adjust the idea that I was singing a humorous song. Right, that's the one he sings, isn't it, on the album? Yeah, his own lead vocals. Yeah, I love that. All right, you're going to be touring soon with the with the attractions in this yeah, country. Yeah, well, we, we, yeah, in um, uh, early September or early, uh, late September, early October, I think it, the tour begins. So right. Then there's a few surprises beyond that. Okay. Meanwhile, you're off to New York to film a video. Even as yeah, it doesn't it sound this is glamorous. <laughs> I mean, this business, we're always in New York one day or other. Thank you very much for coming in today, Elvis. I think it's a good album, as people have heard. And it's called Goodbye, Cruel World. You've chosen this last one, haven't you? Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is, this is one for the family show. All right. It's called Inch by Inch. Cheers. <laughs> Be loved. The current single from Elvis Costello. Welcome along, Mr. C. Hello. All right, you've got the new album out then at the moment, just coming out into the shops. Goodbye, Cruel World. That's right. The title. Quite a striking cover, too. Um, a remarkable picture of some sort of hilltop with a couple of trees and, a, and a, a guy fencing in the middle of it. What's it all about, actually? That's Steve. Yeah. And he just happened to be fencing on the top of a hill. Well, that's one day. When, when, like he always is. <laughs> yeah. Where was the picture taken? Um, uh, Venus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't give away too much. It's, it's a very striking cover. And in fact, we were just discussing the photographs and the, and the pictures on the, the sleeve. Quite a lot of artistic content going into this. Is it your design? In any style. I mean, this, this album isn't really in one style. Uh, the single, you know, is not at all representative any more than Peace Not Time, which came out as an imposter record before, which is just sort of my way of keeping it... So people are really, ironically enough... So, by not calling it under my name, it makes it more personal, you know, because people some mm. maybe perhaps expect... I don't know what they expect anymore from Elvis Costello and the attractions, you know, because we, we have done quite a lot of things in the last few years. And um, I don't think any one track you could say, well, that's definitely what it sounds like, this album. We've got it, we've got it pinned down now. Uh, hopefully there's enough variation in there. I just wanted each song to be as strong as I could make it. Obviously not every song is the best song you've ever written. That would be absolutely impossible. Uh, I think among uh, no, it's Phil Smee who, who who did well. The the layout is and the photographs by Brian Griffin. Mm -hmm. These are make very nice postcards actually, like the picture of you on the back there with the uh, paving stones. Oh, yeah, the picture of me looks like this man is currently serving 20 years in an Angolan <laughs> jail, for being a mercenary. You're not looking very happy in it. Uh, <laughs> goodbye, cruel world. Why why the name? Goodbye, cruel world. What was the thought? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it uh, seemed like a, a good idea at the time, as they say. Um, it, you can draw any significance you want from it. I, I'm quite happy for people to misunderstand it or understand it. All right. Okay. That's a fair enough answer, I suppose. You've been doing so many different sorts of music of late and um, different projects. Was it difficult for you to um, decide what sort of style you were going to make this LP? I, I don't think it is. And also about 8 o'clock, Elvis Costello has promised to drop by to play tracks from his new album, Goodbye Cruel World. That's around 8, and to get us in the mood, here's the theme from Scully. <laughs> Ten 
Star 7. Elvis Costello and the Attractions. The B-side of the single, that one's Turning the Town Red from the Scully TV show. Elvis Costello and the Attractions album, Goodbye at Cruel World. Elvis will be talking us through that LP in just a moment. After we listen to this track off the album, also the current single, I Wanna Be Loved. Some of the songs on this album are among the best I've written. And I think overall it's the best album that we've made because it, it's, there's more stories and interest in it and uh, hopefully the playing, you know, uh, I think complements the uh, sort of ideas we're trying to get across. Do you think there is, a, is there any problem, though, if you do have so much variety then on the album or so many different directions that people might get a bit confused as to what you are at, you know? Well, I don't see why people have to be worried about where you're at at this moment. Why then just enjoy it as it comes up? They either will like the songs individually or they won't like them. I mean, they're not going to like every track necessarily. I don't think it's that varied. It's not, like, wildly varied. It's not, like, willfully difficult to listen to. I mean, I'm not trying to confuse, you know, confuse anybody just, just for the sake of it. Mm. It's just where 